uh, today is going to be all about migrating from Web 1 to Web 2. And I've tried to describe it in three possible ways. So as a view, a mountain and a pitfall. A view is where you are at the moment. You're comfortable in your programming environment. You look around and every, your life, life is good. A mountain is something where you'll have to do some work, but eventually you'll climb up the mountain, you'll get a new view, and things will be better than they are currently. Pitfalls, on the other hand, are problems that you're going to face, which might, might make the, the situation worse or things that you'll just need to take into account. So those are the, are the three areas that, uh, that I'm going to be covering. Now, the question is, why migrate from Web 1 to Web 2? You see, if you already know Web 1 and you've got clients and your clients like it and it's still running on your servers OK, then why do you need to change? Well, you might not need to. There are a lot of benefits in Web 1. For example, and this is your view, this is where you're comfortable, life is good at the moment. It could be that you know Web 1 already, you know all the features and its capabilities. Maybe all the features that it has are all that you need. So why on earth would I need to move? Uh, maybe Web 1 for you has got less bugs than what we have in Web 2. That was certainly the case when Web 2 first came out, less so now. Um, maybe it just, it just works in terms of deployment. You need to make a change, you make a change, you build, you put it up, you deploy it, however you do that, life is good, you, you, know, you, you know exactly how it all operates. Why would I on earth would I want to change that? Community support and Zojo support, while it's not as great as it used to be because there are less people using Web 1 and slow as people are moving to Web 2, you still get decent support on the forums and from Zojo. Plugins. Presumably, all of the plugins you're using work. Why would you want to move away uh, uh, if, if everything, including your plugins, are still operational? Thanks to Einherger and for MBS and others, uh, yeah, they have kept their, their plugins still working on older systems. It could be that you're happy with the, uh, the way the IDE works and your built applications. Maybe they're fast enough. Maybe you, all I need to do is build them for Mac OS or Windows or Linux or Raspberry Pi, and I'm happy with that. Maybe you like the fact that you can still build 32-bit versions of your applications as well as just 64-bit. Maybe you like the 2019 um, uh, IDE. Maybe you actually prefer it to later versions of the IDE. Maybe you really like CGI. That's, that's how you build and that's how you deploy. You put CGI versions of your web apps up there and operate. Another benefit is that it creates a smaller app size. When you go to Web2 build, typically your application XE will be larger than what it is with, um, uh, with them with Web2. Okay. But there are some pitfalls. There are some problems with Web1. You are never going to get any new features built into Web 1. What you have is what you get. If we find that there are bugs over time in Web 1, they're not going to be fixed. Unless they're absolutely major, yeah, Zojo are not going to go back and fix up bugs in Web 1. Uh, your applications will start looking old over time or have started looking old. They look a lot de more desktop-like rather than as modern web apps. <coughs> Getting support is going to be harder over time. As, as the rest of the herd moves on to Web 2, if you're trying to still get support from Zojo and the community, you'll have less answers, less responses. While the plugins work at the moment, I imagine eventually the, the plugins are going to break as they will have moved on to newer technology. Maybe even the operating systems will move on, totally separate from the plugins and Zojo themselves. Maybe the versions of Windows 13, 14, maybe the versions of Mac OS, maybe the versions of Linux that we move to will break our, our web applications. Another issue is there's potentially a dwindling employee um, pool. 
as people who, you tr who you've got in your staff or people you're trying to employ might not want to be working on older technology. They, they have the FOMO. They want they have fear of missing out what new stuff they might be learning to advance their careers uh, in keeping up to date with Web 2 technologies. Um, you're pretty much restricted to one IDE. The latest one that supports Web 1 is 2019 release 3.2. It's the last one that supports Web 1.0 applications. If you're happy with that, fine. If, if you're not, well, you're stuck on it. Another pitfall is that you're not going to get any new processor support. So the world, since Web 1 has moved in many directions towards ARM, so that you won't get, be able to build your Web 1, at 1 applications for Apple Silicon, you won't be able to build them for Windows version of ARM or the new Linux versions of ARM. That just, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, also, certain plugins, like I use Graffiti Suite, when uh, the, the Anthony who created that has locked the version with the Web 1 support and you can still buy it from him and download it, but he's not making any major changes or any changes to that. All of his new stuff, all of his new options and things are coming in Web 2 only. Now, there, there are some of the problems with Web 1, but Web 2 is not without its problems too. Again, pitfalls. Uh, when it came out a few years ago, it was very buggy. The first time, you know, normally when Zojo bring out updates, it's fairly smooth transition. You might get a deprecation, you might get something works a slightly different way. You have a small amount of, of changes you need to make. That was not the case with Web 2. It was originally, there were, there were major problems with it and major holes in the product where I... That was my introduction to Graffiti Suite, mainly because I couldn't complete my, the, the migration of my web projects without avoiding some of the tools that you had in Zojo and filling those, those holes with Graffiti Suite. Uh, a lot of that has been fixed up now. Um, other problems, web styles. When in Web 1, I loved web styles. You would define them exactly how they looked and felt and, and you would apply them all over the place. Web styles in, in version 2 are more of a pain and uh, if you want to go down the bootstrap line, again, it's not something that I know a lot about but others do and that's a new, uh, a new area of pain as well. Um, initially, at least, Zojo had a mountain of bugs in the product that you would do calls to, to things like list boxes and say, how many rows have you got selected and would uh, give you the wrong answer or no answer. Uh, other things were uh, showstoppers where, for example, I, in my list boxes, I like to be able to change the number of rows, and uh, not the number of rows, the number of columns through code. The commands were there to do it, but it wasn't working initially. You, you could say change my, from five columns to six and it would just, you know, it would just ignore you. Uh, certainly for quite a while, you would go onto the forums and all the community seemed to be doing was complaining about Web 2. Thankfully, most of that is now resolved and it's a lot nicer place to be in, but for a while it, was, it wasn't good. There were things that, that didn't work in other ways. I would put objects onto containers and put, and put them in a tab panel. And if that tab, was, tab panel wasn't showing, when I went and updated it, you'd click on the tab, bring it to the front, and it wasn't refreshed. Just silly things like that that you go, it should work, I've done, I checked my code, it's, it, it should be fine, but it wasn't working. Now, again, a lot of these things um, uh, have been fixed up now. Uh, there was a move from with API 1 to API 2 to take a lot of things from which different functions that were used to be base 1 and they've now shifted them to be base 0. So that's the sort of thing that you go through and some of them are easy to understand, some of them are easy to con convert but other ones sort of muck with your head when you're looking for certain characters and you have to start counting from 0. The, the zeroth character is the first character rather than the 1, that sort of thing. Uh, another thing, you, 
if you have um, things like easy TCP sockets, secure sockets, and things like that, there's pretty much been a move across to things like URL connections. So, so there's, there's changes there. Other things, things that you are completely familiar with in the database, like having SQL select commands, SQL execute, having record sets. I mean, you, you, you go through them in your sleep. The, a lot of those things have now changed because uh, Web 2 was now API 2 rather than API 1. And so you have to relearn lots of different things when you, when you move. So you're no longer dealing with uh, record sets, you're now dealing with row sets, you're now no, no longer dealing with errors, you're now dealing with exceptions, and you have to put things in a try-in, try-loop, all that sort of stuff. Um, as if all of that wasn't enough, um, they went and renamed a whole lot of events. It's, it does make sense, but event isn't the sort of thing you can just do a search and replace on. So things like the open event, something as crucial as that changed to opening. So that is something that you'll need to sort of get your head around as to how the new events uh, work compared with how they do in Web 1. Now, as I said, some of these changes <coughs> Uh, a simple search and replace, but other ones aren't. I've got a printout of a spreadsheet, I think it's going to be available online, which, uh, which goes through all the different commands. I just documented them as I went, put them in a spreadsheet saying, look, this is how, this is the command in or function in Web 1, this is what it is in Web 2, and a bit of a description on the side as to sort of what I needed to do. But you, so as I said, some of them, the easy ones, you'll just be able to do a search and replace. Other ones, you're going to have to go through the code line by line to actually fix how, how they operate because they're different. Final pitfall for Web 2, there's no CGI. If you must have CGI deployment, then you can't use Web 2. It only runs as a separate uh, application on your server. OK, so those were the problems with Web 2 what are the benefits? When I finally climb up this mountain, get a new view, what, what's it going to look like from up there? You will get a lot of new features, a lot of new capabilities in the tool that you never had before. Uh, most of the, if not all, of the big bugs that we had at the start have now been fixed, so it's a lot more reliable environment than it was. You will get way better support for your problems from uh, the community on the forum and from so Zojo themselves as you, uh, uh, as, you, as you find particular problems, you'll get great support. Uh, all of the plugins work. Again, thanks to the plugin makers, they've kept their stuff up to date and they compile for natively for Apple Silicon, Windows ARM, Linux ARM, so, and, and a lot of that stuff has, that used to be available for desktop and web in the background is now even available for mobile. So if you do write cross-platform apps that need uh, something like encryption or zipping or connecting to different databases and things, if the plugin can do it uh, on, the, on the other platforms, it's likely you'll be able to do it across the board, which makes my life a lot easier. It's set to mirror. I'm not sure what happened. OK. Um, so we're, we're down to about here. Um, another benefit is that it runs on, it will run on the latest operating systems. That is something that Zojo will keep up to date. In other words, if Linux, Windows, Mac come out with new versions that broke Zojo, broke your IDE, break your deployment, application, your built applications, they are going to work until it gets fixed. So you will always be able to run on the latest versions. Staff will be happier because they'll be working on the latest tools. Um, you get some other, other benefits. Uh, there's a lot more uh, efficient work between the browser and the server. They're, they're, that that is, is, um, uh, has been vastly improved, and particularly that top one, better recon uh, reconnection if you're, if you're lost. With Web 1, if you are logged in to, on your mobile phone 
and to, to a Web1 app, and then you go, oh, I just want to check my mail, and then come instantly back, you're, you are disconnected instantly. If you shut your laptop, open it up straight away, you are now disconnected. There is no sort of uh, reconnection. That, with Web2, it keeps a record and will attempt to reconnect, and most times, as long as you haven't been away for too long, you will reconnect to your same session and just keep on going as you had before. Because these things are a lot more efficient now with Web2, is that usually you can handle more simultaneous users uh, on, the, on your same instance. Uh, your web app now will look like, more like a modern web app, not like a desktop app. And some of the things that we had to do in code before to make your app more like a responsive web app, which means as you resize, things move around and adjust on the screen, a lot of those can be put into things like flex uh, containers, canvases, and so the browser does that work for you. Uh, if you create cross-environment applications so that you write some code that has external methods for desktop, a desktop version and a web version, say a mobile version, because it's now so much, so not only cleaner, but it's now consistent uh, across uh, each of those environments, it will make your life uh, a lot easier because you'll just have one set of code for all of it. And finally, we've got other benefits too that we never had before, the ability to create, at least built in natively, we have now have the ability to create charts and PDF, but of course you can still use Christian's plugins if you need. Okay, so you decide, okay, I'd like to give it a try. What's gonna be the problems that you'll first hit? First of all, you'll go and have a you, you, you'll load it up into, into Web2 and go compile, and your program that was running beautifully before all of a sudden will have an enormous number of compile errors. Apart from the fact that what is appearing on the screen will look ugly, and, uh, and you'll get all sorts of errors saying certain things didn't come across. So for me, it took me a few weeks to do my Web1 to Web2 application. I went through four main updates. Now, mine's a cross-environment situation, so bear that in mind. But first of all, I remained within the desktop and did an API 1 to API 2 uh, conversion. And that, for my large application, came up with over 20,000 compile errors, which I slowly had to go through. The second conversion was when I took the web version of the app and took it from version one to version two, where I had about 10,000 errors coming up. Uh, and the third one was when I, uh, when uh, Zojo did a lot of work on the mobile side, which was very different from the other platforms and made it very consistent. But I still, it made my, my coding uh, a lot better but I still, in that, had to undo about 5,000 compile errors moving from, uh, from mobile. And then the fourth change that I had was when, every, when they brought in the new desktop uh, control. So we used to have a thing called a button. Now it's desktop button, web button, mobile button. And, uh, and it had, we had to, there were about 5,000 compile errors with that. Now, while that adds up to a lot, a lot of the changes can be a quick search and replace. So it's, uh, in some regards, it's easier than it might imply. The problem, in some regards, is that a lot of the changes to fix up these errors are really boring because you're doing the usual compile, find an error, search, you know, fix that error, go and search for all the other occurrences of it, and then compile again, you know, rinse and repeat, you know, run, <coughs> fix, search, run, fix, search, and it's, it's just, it can be mind-numbingly boring just to go through fixing up code that you know was working five minutes ago and now for whatever reason is not working. The other thing is, because I separated, uh, because I substituted 
certain commands uh, or controls from, for example, Listbox and brought in a graffiti grid instead, I now had a problem in that every time I, I did a substitute of an object, I'd now have to go through and change all the code to adjust to how the graffiti grid worked instead. So in my circumstance, I went and created methods to do like uh, how to you know, add a row, uh, count the number of rows, remove all rows. I, I, would, I passed the, the object across to the method and it did all the work. So that the advantage there was that I could substitute a graffiti grid in a web list box at any time. It would just pass it across and go, okay, if you're a web list box, do this. If you're a, um, if you're a graffiti grid, do that. If I'm on the desktop, do this. If I'm on the web, do that. If I'm on mobile, do something else. So that, that uh, is a bit of work but made my life a lot easier because it uh, made it more flexible. Okay, now, there are some pitfalls with Web2 because certain objects will be missing. Uh, web styles, the way that they worked before, they don't work now. So if you love web styles, check out and just make sure if web styles are essential for your operation, make sure that, that, that they can in fact work. But web styles are, are a big one for people. Uh, horizontal and vertical scroll bars, I haven't used them much, but they're, they're missing. I did use the uh, separator, the dotted line, often in my uh, Web1 apps. That's gone. Uh, other ones, not so, I didn't use them too much. A YouTube movie player, database query. Sorry, see you later, don't, don't need you. Um, serial connection, I never used. Animator, page source, again, things that I don't use so much, but if you use them, they might be uh, an issue. Other things that were missing that people complained about were the key pressed event. So you'd go in, into your web app, you'd go and put a label in, you'd put a key field, and every time the person pressed a character into that particular field, you could evaluate it and fix it or reject it, whatever you wanted. Uh, and so that was gone. And so I'm not sure if it's gone back in again. I know there are different workarounds and things, but cer certain... Um, things that you expect to be there, like certain events, might be either missing or changed. Um, dialogue boxes have changed. I used to use different floating uh, palettes and things or use sheets certain ways and modal dialogue boxes. Uh, you might want to check to see how they've changed because they will be working differently as well. <coughs> well, while there, that's bits that are missing, there are new things that you never had before. Uh, you've got a, a breadcrumb trail. So if you want to, if, you, if your application has people drilling down through the data, you can have a breadcrumb trail to let them know exactly where they're up to and they can quickly jump back if need be. Uh, pagination, jump forwards, backwards, start, end, that sort of stuff is, is available. And my two favourites, page panels and uh, tab panels have revolutionised my, uh, my Web 2 development. Uh, if, if you find your web apps have just got too, much, too many controls all over the place, put a tab panel on and it's like you're getting whole new screens of information available. And so you just need to show people the small amount that they need at any particular time. Page panels, again, brilliant, because if there are things that people don't have uh, permission to see, you can hide it behind a page panel and only show it if, they, uh, if necessary. Um, combo box. We've had it on the desktop, haven't had it on the web, now we've got it on the web. So a web combo box is brilliant. Click on the pop-up or type, or type whatever you want in, it's great. Date picker, we've had third parties to do that, now it's got its own date picker built in. Charting and PDF, as I said before, uh, are great. Uh, audio player, uh, generic object, I don't know what that is, somebody can tell me, but um, colour groups as well, useful thing to have uh, uh, in your web apps. So those are some of the new things you're going to get. There are also new capabilities, it's still not updated, it's weird, new capabilities in uh, old objects. So typically when you, you've got a form in a web app, you'll go and put a label in and then you'll put a, a text field or a text area next to it. Well, 
now your text field can actually have the label built into it. You don't actually need to have a separate label to go and add and manage in there. Uh, it's part of the text field object if you want to make use of it. So it's just one thing to move around. We never had that before, but now we do. Timers. We had timers before, got timers now, but now you can choose where the timer runs. It can run in the browser or on the server. Obviously, if the server's ticking over the browser, it takes a bit more server CPU, but if it's in the browser, the browser does that work. Uh, images. When you display graphics, graphic images on, um, uh, on Web 1, they're just the one resolution. You move to uh, Web 2, they are modern pictures now, which means you get the three resolutions, the standard resolution plus, um, uh, plus double and triple. The advantage there is that you, if somebody is using a high DPI screen for their web browser, you get a lot higher, uh, higher resolution images showing to the user, which looks great because if you've got a high DPI screen and your web page looks all pixely, it's, it's not as nice. Also, uh, you're getting uh, support for dark mode. Maybe that's an issue for your customers, I don't know, but, but it's, it's not hard to go and put in support for that. Okay, <clears throat> you think, yes, I'd like to actually do the migration, but you've, there's some preparation that you're going to have to do. You need to go through your Web1 app and go, is there anything that I do that is a little weird, out of the ordinary? Do I use uh, sockets a particular way? Do I use dialog boxes? Do I use web styles to do fancy designs? All that sort of stuff. What are the weird things that you might do in your app? And test, create a, a sample app, test to see what it would look like in Web 2 before you move your whole project across. Check that you can do it. Maybe it'll be hard to, to replicate that function. It might even be impossible to replicate that function. But find out now before you start to move your whole project across. In other words, don't start your migration until you know that you will be able to actually finish it. Second thing, if your code behind the scenes, even if it's compiling and working, if it is a schmozzle, then clean it up before you actually do the migration. Things like um, if you have the same routine, I've seen this in projects I've taken over from others, where they've got essentially the same routine in 20 different locations. Clean that up first, go and create a class, a method, whatever you want to do, and, and make sure you reduce your code, clean your code, and that sort of stuff before you do uh, the conversion across. Not only will that save you a lot of time in debugging and, and fixing up the problems, but when you get across it, you'll know, OK, if I do have compiled problems, I know it's an issue with Web 2 rather than with my original code. Another thing that I would say is worth doing is standardise the format of your code. So that means... Uh, setting all the, uh, the case and the spaces and, you know, in between. If you're someone who jams an equal, you know, and your, your text either side of the equal or whatever, that's not the standard format. So if you right-click on, if you go select all on your code, right-click on it, you'll see there's an option under the right-click uh, which is to standardise format, and it will change all your code in one hit. The reason why this is important is that when you're going through and doing a search and replace, you want to be very specific. In other words, if, you're, if you find the mid command has now changed to be called middle, you don't want to do a search in your, in your code for the word mid, because that's going to find it in every single string, it's going to find it in every heading, you know, all the places that you want and don't want it to change, it, it will muck up. So if your code is, um, is a lot more standardised, you can search for space you know, or dot, mid, left bracket or something like that and do a change that way. And that will, um, having standard code formats w will mean that you get, um, uh, you'll be missing the false positives, you'll get the positive positives, true positives. 
There is a script you can download. You just search for it on the forum. All of these slides, by the way, I've given to Zojo, so you don't need to copy them. But uh, reformat code.zojo script, you can download the link from the forum. And what that does is you put it into the scripts folder. And just next to your plugins folder will be another folder called scripts. <laughs> Drop it in there. And that means as you're typing code or if you just arrow down through your code, as it leaves a line, it automatically applies the standard formatting to the line you were just on. So that keeps any new code or changes to code that you're doing, uh, keeps them in the standard format. If you hate the look of the standard format, that's fine. Change it to standard format and then and do your migration and then later turn off, get rid of this auto script and go back to, to however you like it to look. Now, if you find that you can't move from API 1 to API 2 for whatever reason, then don't bother with Web 2. It's... it's um, but if you can, if you can move your code from API 1 to API 2, you will find over time your brain will get used to the new words, you, the, your code will look a lot cleaner, it'll be easier to debug, and if you do create, if you do do coding across environments, desktop, web, mobile, you'll see that it's a lot more consistent, so you're not, no longer rewiring your mind as you're moving from one environment to another. So as a, as a quick summary, desktop is very forgiving. Desktop, you can have Web 1 commands or functions and Web 2, and they live side by side happily. Web 2 is almost all API 2 only. It's got a few bits and pieces still that, that conform to API 1, but most of it is API 2. If you do work on mobile, it is strictly API 2 only. So if you can, make that move to API 2. Second thing you've got to do, another pitfall in terms of the migration is the cost. Thank you. How weird. Okay, cost of migration. We're not moving, when we go from web 1 to web 2, we're not moving from A to B. You're moving from A to A. But it will take a long time, some time, depends on the size of your project, to move from A to A. So you're spending time, essentially, for nothing to get to where you currently are. And time means money. You may have clients who really don't care. If it looks like a desktop app, if it looks like Web 1 or it looks like Web 2, they may go, I don't care. In fact, they might even hate the new version of it. They might not like the look and feel. They might prefer the old way that it worked. Maybe that's worth checking out. When you work out how much it's going to cost in terms of time or retraining and things like that, you've got to decide who's going to pay for it, particularly if you employ staff. Are you going to absorb the cost of doing it or are you going to pass that on to your client? Is the client happy to, to pay for it? Um, if it takes you, say, two to three weeks, what's the opportunity cost? And say it costs you thousands of dollars and pounds to actually do, what's the opportunity cost of that? In other words, if you weren't spending your two to three weeks on this or your thousands of pounds, what on earth would you spend that money or that time on? Presumably on other particular projects. So you've got to think about the opportunity cost of it. And even once you've done it, once you've got there to, to this new Web 2, is it actually going to generate any new sales or you know, to your existing clients or to new clients? Something you've got to ask. Will it actually make your life easier in future moving to Web 2? In other words, if there are changes that you want to make, you want to bring in charting and PDF and other capabilities like that, tab panels, will it actually make your life easier or make the changes faster or make the product better down the other end? It's, again, it's good to actually itemise some of these things. Uh, also, the final pitfall is 
are there any changes to the client's environment? If you're building something and giving it to them and they're putting it on their host, what happens if their host supports CGI but they don't support a separate running application? So you, there may be additional costs and things in terms of uh, getting a new server or a new host or something like that that can support um, uh, the services and that might be a higher cost than what you've got at the moment. So, some tips. Ensure that you have, I reckon, uh, depending on the size of your team, about two to three weeks of uninterrupted time to migrate to where you are currently. Um, and you'll need, to, depending on the size, if you have multiple teams, think who is going to maintain the, the existing version over that time and who's going to do the actual migration because you'll probably need two to, to divide the, the, the job up. Next thing, make sure you have a backup. Take, take your folder, all of your artwork, all of your, all of your external libraries and everything, and make sure that you completely back it up and, and stick it somewhere safe. Because if you go off and try and do this migration over a, a few weeks and then find it's an absolute disaster. I, you know, I can't do it, and I've changed all my code. I can't even. I haven't even got. Make sure you've got a copy of Web One that you could go back to if there was a a major problem. Now, I would also suggest if you do share your external code amongst different applications or you know desktop and web that sort of thing. May I, I would suggest you actually duplicate those external libraries because as you're going, moving it to and fixing up code with, with Web.2, uh, if you go and make changes to Web.2 and those libraries are still mapped into your Web.1 application, that you will be breaking your Web.1 application. Now, there are alternatives to duplicating those external libraries um, and that is that you can uh, use you know, hash if commands to go, if I'm using this Zojo version, then do it this way, otherwise uh, go and do it another way. But the reason I'm saying split it up and is not only for a disaster recovery, but also once the move has happened, once you moved across to Web 2, you won't be going back to your old libraries. You won't be going back to Web 1. You don't want to maintain two lots of code. You will eventually, the goal is that you'll be on Web 2 and you will not be using Web 1 anymore. Another migration tip is use the forum. You will come up with lots and lots of questions as to, well, how do I, I used to do it this way, how do I do it now? Um, a, most, if not all, of those questions and answers will be on the forum. So don't just put your question up, do a search, you'll find the answer very quickly. The documentation, both lots of documentation, old and new, are available on the, uh, uh, on the web, uh, showing you what's deprecated and how the new one works. So make use of that. If you can't get the answers in the documentation or from the forum, then of course pose a question to the forum and people are very happy to give you answers. Okay. <clears throat> what are the steps once you decide, okay, I, I do want to do it? Now, you might want to do this as an exercise, opening up your Web 1 application in Web 2, as long as you've got a backup, and compile and see what will happen. But I only recommend you do that for, for fun because you are just going to see how awful the layout looks and things. Instead, what I would do is run two versions of the IDE simultaneously, ideally with two separate monitors. So one monitor with 2019 running Web 1 and the other one running 2023 with Web 2 on it. Uh, I would recommend you not try to uh, fix up your existing app, but I would suggest you actually rebuild your app uh, afresh. Create a whole new version of your app and bring across the components from what you've had before. Uh, first of all, I would bring across all of your external libraries, all, all the things that don't have a GUI, all the calls, all the modules, all the classes, bring them across into a blank Web2 application 
and just see if it runs. You will find you've got all sorts of errors there, but at least that will, fixing those up will give you a good foundation with all of that GUI-less stuff uh, on there, anything that doesn't have an interface. Uh, just make sure they compile, fix up those, uh, uh, all of those particular functions en masse. When you go build and it says you've got lots and lots of errors, don't do it section by section, do it function by function. So when you find a particular function doesn't work, search for that function everywhere. While you've got it in your head, how that particular function works, what the new wording is, whether it's base one, base zero, do all of that within your application first and then move on to the next function. If you do it where you're moving from one section to another and coming back to the same function again, you've got to rewire your head and go, how does this work again? If you've done it all before, it makes life easier. Then bring in your containers or rebuild your containers. And again, they usually go into your app so that if you can bring your containers across uh, or build your new containers with the controls in them, make sure they compile, then finally, start building your windows and putting your containers into your windows. The reason why I'm suggesting you rebuild is not only will it actually be easier and faster, but you can actually make a better app. If you've been doing certain things in Web 1, you may find there's actually a better way of doing it, like with page panels and tab panels that you never had access to before, and now you go, well, instead of putting a whole lot of containers and having you know, hide commands, you go, well, I'll just put a tab panel in there and put my container onto the tab panel. I get a better application than I had before. So, so that's, that is you know, why I'm suggesting rebuild. Another thing is sometimes you need to, you, you had to be a bit rewired with Web 2. So do a small window first. When you, you know, like an about box or a login screen, when you're moving controls around, you normally think, oh, controls are 20 pixels high. They're not 20 pixels high. They're now 38 pixels high. Or if you've got labels built in, they're 70 pixels high. So, so the layout works differently. So again, do, a, do something small first and then uh, on small windows rather than trying to do your, your large windows all in one hit. As you're going through, also, write down the changes just so you can keep up with, with, with your progress. And make sure you do constant backups. I don't mean backups once a day. I mean backups every few hours. You are doing, often, search and replaces or changes on huge amounts of your code. If you're backing up every, every two to three hours, I mean quit out of Zojo, Take your whole folder where everything is and right click on it and go zip and keep multiple versions of that. If you get to the end of the day or the end of the week and you've just done a search, replace, save, quit and you realise you have stuffed up something monumentally, it is, gonna, it is really hard to go back and undo a search and replace because you, you don't know where they all are. They, you might get all, all, all sorts of problems finding where did I do a search and replace. If you've got a backup, sure, you might have lost two or three hours going back to a previous backup that you know worked, but at least that losing those two or three hours is better, uh, is, is better than losing a week's work and is faster than trying to undo changes that you've made. Okay. Now, I've said before I used Graffiti Suite. I don't work for Graffiti Suite, get no money for them, but there are a few things in there for the web too that are just brilliant that's worth me talking about. One is Graffiti Grids. Why did I change? I don't use Graffiti Grids everywhere, but in a certain number of areas I use them and they're very useful. Uh, as I mentioned before, I like to be able to change the number of columns in code. I wasn't able to do that with a web list box. Uh, and originally, determining how many rows were selected was unreliable because I changed buttons as to whether whether you know you can uh, allowed to do an edit or not was based on whether there's a row selected that sort of thing. Um, I wasn't able to do variable row height, column width that sort of thing. You can do that. Um, putting pictures into into cells of a list box is as easy as as you might see later. Um, you can drag the widths of columns so that, you know, instead of um, you know, you, if a column's not wide enough for that text, make it wider, smaller, mm. it's up to you. 
And I don't use it so much, but you can drag the, you know, the order of rows and columns around if you need. OK, so that's the graffiti grid, some of the things that I got out of it versus a, a web list box. Other, <coughs> there, there are other options that I use. There, he's got a ton of things you can use. Some of the things that I find use, very useful is he's got a date picker and a time picker, also something which, which is a date and time picker. So you just have the one control. It does the whole lot because, you know, if you're... I wrote a billing program, needs date, needs time, does it all for you. Uh, there's a preloader, a graffiti preloader. So that means if your window is taking a while to appear, I have a preloader, grays the screen, it's got a little spinning thing in the middle, spins around until it's re until <coughs> your, your page is loaded and then it, it disappears and shows on the page. So the user doesn't think, oh no, the program's frozen. It knows that something's going on. Uh, graffiti syntax editor, so, so there's one stage where I show a bit of um, a SQL command. It actually highlights the particular words in there, so it makes it look nicer. Uh, graffiti editor is an HTML editor, so it looks and acts like a word processor, but behind the scenes it's creating HTML. So I use that for things like invoice templates and things. Graffiti calendar is basically a, a monthly calendar where you can put objects on there. Timeline. Timeline's like a Gantt chart, but it has different bars for, for <coughs> calendar type events. Graffiti dialog is a flexible means of putting messages on the screen. You, I either use them with a, a normal OK button, or you can set them to timed. So they appear, and the little a line sort of goes past, and then when it gets to the end, it will automatically close itself down. But you can also put containers on to, if you wanted to onto um, uh, onto the dialog boxes. And another one I use is a circle completion thing. So, for example, uh, where people want to pay for one of my services, they click on a button, it takes them off to PayPal, they have 30 minutes to, to complete the, the PayPal purchase. So I can tell in my app, uh, I te check every so about 10 seconds. Have they sort of paid? Have they paid? Have they paid? Meanwhile, this thing ticks around. It shows a countdown from 30 minutes down to zero. If they don't do it in 30 minutes, it cancels the transaction. They, they, but it allows me to, uh, to, to see what's going and, um, uh, and they can see how much time they've got left as well. OK. Demonstration. Let me jump out. So this is a typical Web1 application that I've got. So you've got things like uh, menus up there that can pop down and a toolbar. And it looks, you know, it's got not bad functionality, but it's got, um, uh, it, it, it does look a bit old. I put sort of style shadows and things on stuff. I'm not developing this application anymore, but a customer still wants to wants the results out of it, so I'm happy. Um, so this is this isn't a web app. This is my website, my test website built with EverWeb. So if if you've been using Rapid Weaver and you don't know what to move to, uh, if you want to move away, EverWeb written in Zojo, great application. I don't get any money from them, but uh, so I've created my application to to look as much like. Um, uh, the, the EverWeb that I can. So if I come across here, this is now my application. So this is my help on the website. You can get help even without buying or downloading the program. If you want to know how charts work, you just type chart in there, click on it, and it shows you HTML-based help as to, um, as to what different charts and things like that that, that you can create within the program. So. Another one is the, um, let me come here to, I'll add that up. Um, one of the things that you can do is um, you can see that across the top we have a toolbar. So if I click on the, that, that's actually a, a button on the toolbar, it actually comes up with a, a dialog box. That's a graffiti suite uh, dialog. So it tells you what they are. You can have as many lines as you want. In this case, it's got an OK button. Click on it, and it disappears. So it looks modern web-ish and, um, and, and works well. Another thing that, that you've got is that's still loading. 
is, is a hamburger. So, for example, here's where people can log in and see the... Um, uh, and, and change their account on the, and pay and that sort of stuff. So what I've got here is that toolbar, and this happens automatically. As soon as you get too small, you see it, the toolbar changes from the buttons up the top there up to this hamburger. So you click on the hamburger and then you get the options under there. So if somebody is working on a very small screen, they can, uh, they can make use of the full size uh, of the toolbar by clicking on the hamburger. You just get that automatically. So that's some of the more uh, web stuff to do. Um, so this is my login screen. So I tried to create it a bit like Netflix, where you've got different pictures, different avatars for different people. And this is one of those flex layouts. Now, I don't have multiple users on there, but you can make them as, as small as you want if there's lots of people in your company, or you can make them as large as you want. It's up to you. But if you resize the window, um, in Web 1, when I used this, I actually, actually had to calculate how wide's the window, how big's my avatar, that, how many can I fit, a, um, OK, and then sort of lay them out. And you would see it redraw. With the new version, you just as you you can resize the the browser window as much as you want, and they'll all just sort of quickly move around because the browser does all the work for you. So log in here. There's the loader, by the way, showing up. So you click on it, and the loader sort of grays, so that even if it's taking a bit of time, like the login process usually does, you don't get so frustrated uh, with it. <coughs> So it's a bit hard to tell, but that graphic you know, is a high-resolution graphic, so it's nice and easy to read on my retina screen. Uh, this down on the left-hand side is a graffiti grid, so we've got a hierarchical menu as well as different... You, know, you can have pictures in there so that you can... Uh, I've just got it set so if you click on it, it'll actually show you the options within there. It sort of like opens. You can click on the triangle if you want, but I've just got you click anywhere on that one. If it's hierarchical, it'll open it or close it. Um, so there's help built in. There's um, things like if you go to quit, it'll come up with a modal dialog box. Uh, so that's that's what a... Uh, the, the modal dialog box looks like now. You can colour the buttons however you want. So, I, so I'll just cancel out of this because I don't want to quit. So if I go, for example, into invoices, you can see down the bottom here, I've coloured each of those buttons down the bottom red or green or blue. So blue is typically the default because there's no default button anymore. But... Um, uh, and red is usually something dangerous, either delete or, in this case, deactivate. And green is, a, is a, just a safe choice. Now, some of them, you can see, are greyed out. As soon as I click on that invoice, you'll see that they now become enabled. And, uh, and again, this is no work that I've done other than saying, you know, give it a particular colour. Now, I'm going to go in and... See, here's my invoice. Here's a whole lot of... Uh, there have been no jobs allocated to it. I'm going to click Add All. And what it's going to do is it's going to sort of like tick all of these. If I go turn them all on, boom, they're all ticked there. I come over to my invoice and go, OK, what invoice <laughs> template do I want? Let's have a look at that one. Build. And there you go. It's not only brought in the HTML, it's uh, merged the whole table of information into there, uh, determined what the cost of the invoice is, and gone and put the, the, cost of, you know, in the, the cost of the invoice over into there. If I go, oh, I don't like that one, I actually like one with a signature. OK, there's a different style invoice. Uh, uh, still don't like that one. Let's have a look at this invoice and go build. So it's the same data, same table. In this case, it's a table within a table. I've got a table here with nice pictures and that sort of stuff, and said mail merged the invoice table in. So you, you get access. This is using the Graffiti Suite HTML editor. So there's no, it, because it's an editor, and even though I've mail merged, I can go in there and type any text that I want to, export as a PDF, export it as. Uh, as an email, so, so when I come over to the email, I can say, look, make that the body of the email. So I just sent it, and that, and that HTML will be the email that's sent. Or I can say, 
look, use a different one template uh, as being the, the main body of the email and use that um, invoice as being a, an attached PDF. Again, using MBS's curl routines to go off and send emails out with an HTML body and with attachments if necessary. So I'm not here to flog my program. I'm here to say here are some of the things you can do to make it look like a modern web app with modern web size controls and buttons and functions. And I think most people, most IT people, would be hard pressed to know what language this had been written in. You know, it, 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 looks, it looks like a, and responds like a modern web app. Now, that, let me just go back into Keynote. And I think I've got five minutes for questions. Yes? Okay, so it's not a question, but a but a a, a statement in that I, I think if I understood it correctly, if I did want to change the layout and the way that things look, and and uh, that it is possible to, you know, like we used web styles before, we can go in there and change the the look and feel of your built uh, you know, application uh, by using. I think it's uh, different bootstrap technologies or others to, to change it. Yes, you can do that. I know people who are you know, within the Zojo community who are doing that in a big way. Um, that's not something I know a lot about. So you can ask me a question, but I'll just be deferring it to others. The, oh, the, re the code reformat script. So... You are right. So when I so the the again the statement is, when you are standardising your uh, your code behind the scenes to standardise format, and you're using the script that you drop into your scripts folder, that script that you're dropping in that reformat code dot zojo script uh, is actually a text file that you can open up and look at, and you can configure it. Uh, to operate the way that you want your text to appear. And yes, I have done that and it is quite flexible and, um, and a, a, a good opportunity if you want to have consistent looking at code amongst all of your programmers. So the, the comment is, when you're dividing your team amongst those who are going to maintain Web 1 and the other half of the team is going to do the migration to Web 2, make sure that any changes that the Web 1 people are doing uh, is, is documented so that, you, so that those can be uh, brought across to Web 2 when it is finished. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on those new features uh, or new bug fixes, I would say. I would recommend that you don't add new features during the middle of the migration. Keep them off until you, you move across to Web 2. Otherwise, you're going to potentially have to debug uh, the new feature again. Uh, your app, is it running on like Zozo Cloud or it's running on its own server? I don't have the money to afford a Zojo Cloud. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I, I, I have a cheap and nasty uh, host based in, in, well, they're worldwide, but they actually base it in, in London on, on Google servers. So I'm, I, sub, I, I rent it from them, they rent from Google. And, uh, and uh, so, no, it's not running on Zojo Cloud. I don't have any problem with Zojo Cloud except for the money. While I'm developing, I'm on the cheapest, nastiest plan that they've got, which is like two gigs of RAM and I think two processors on a Windows 2019 
uh, data center server. At, when I, I've got two of them running, uh, when eventually I release the app across all the platforms, I will probably go to them and, hey, bump it up, bump up the RAM, bump up the CPUs so I can support more than just me. Okay, but you didn't have problems to set it up on the, the server? Please. Sorry? You, the, the app, you didn't have problems to set it up on the server? Was it easy? Or? In, in installing the app is very easy because it's, it's an XE. Um, okay, in terms of what, what I've written behind the scenes is, is when I have a web app launches uh, every time, it goes, uh, if it's run, if it says, oh, oh, I'm running on a Windows, it goes off and builds its own Windows service. Uh, the advantage of a Windows service is that if my app was to crash, it would, Windows would automatically launch it. It's very simple and you can specify how long it, ta how long it has to be crashed for, how many times, you know, if it keeps on crashing, how many times does it go, okay, enough's enough, I'm not going to relaunch you anymore. So all of that I've, uh, I've, I can provide somebody if they need. Uh, you can do the same things under Linux as well, usually with an external tool to keep it alive and launch it on start and things like that. Um, the other thing that I do, by the way, is I hate certificates, but you have to deal with them. I use let, uh, Let's Encrypt. I go and build that on my host who have my domain names. I then create that. I, I put that onto my normal web uh, onto my normal web page server. My web apps, every time they launch or once a day, they go and grab that um, that master certificate bring it down to, to the web app themselves, rename it to be the name of the application, drop it into the parent folder of my web application, and they, they, that means that my web apps are always using the latest version of the certificate should I ever update it. Okay. Um, any... Yes? Uh, as far as I'm aware, he has completely moved all of his tools across to Web 2 and only supports Web 2. And since he did that, that seems to have been finished more than a year or two ago. Uh, he's brought out a number of other tools. He also brings, often brings out his tools, or I nag him to make it available across desktop and web. So I get the same, so things like... Um, the, the monthly chart, the, the calendar and the timeline, the Gantt chart, those sorts of things are available on desktop and on web, um, which maybe they, when they first come out, they're only on one. Some of the things he is migrating to mobile as well. So he's given me some of one or two of those things behind the scenes, uh, which is massive. Um, don't tell him this, I'm sure he won't watch this video, but he gave me a very pre-release version of the HTML editor. So I can use exactly the same HTML editor to edit my invoices on desktop and web and now on mobile. It's not good on, it's too small on a, on a phone, but on an iPad it'd be fine. So if you did want to build invoices, grabs the data from the database using Christian's plugins, displays the information, you can edit it if you want to, save it, puts it back in the database. It's like, it just makes my life so much easier. Yes, I used to. Um, I, I've used Linux for years. Um, I and I, there are, okay, there are, I have struggled with which is the best. You know, I've gone, you know, with Ubuntu, I've gone with Debian, I've gone with Red Hat, I've jumped between the others and they work differently and the pro, all, all I need is something simple to, to be able to deploy, if there's a problem to relaunch, to, to be able to, 
handle certificates or, or, okay, I've got a new version, how do I stop it and start it? Um, yes, Linux does that well, but when the, the host I was with were using those Linux servers, I had them based over in the US, said, hey, they've, they've, they've now got uh, a Windows data center version of it. I went, it, it, I, I'd probably, pref yeah, sure, it'd be cheaper and easier probably using them uh, on Linux, but I can say, so it's cheaper on Linux, but I can say it's easier for me to manage uh, on a Windows server because uh, I like Windows services. They are so simple and so powerful. I can just go in there, look at the list of services and go stop, 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 stop for all my different ones, put the new, you know, drag and drop into, into the, the right folders, the folder structure is easy, and go start, 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 and boom, the whole thing's done within a few minutes. Uh, I also find when I connect onto the Linux servers, I use um, VNC, which, which works. I can see my, my Linux server, but it doesn't share the clipboard. So when I'm entering in passwords and things like that, it, you actually have to usually send a file or something which has got it. When I, when I connect onto the Windows virtual machines, uh, it, I use Microsoft's desktop Connect uh, program. It synchronize. It synch not only synchronizes the keyboard, but it actually lets me map a folder to my physical desktop on my computer here. So if I'm, I just sort of go, okay, into into the network drive. Oh, there's my desktop. Drag and drop the the file across. It's it's trivially easy. Before I used to have to have VNC open and an FTP program and copy and it was a, a bit more messy. But Linux is fine. I'm, I may go back to it. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So, so the, the, the comment is that, like, essentially, I, the IT world is in constant movement. If while things may be working at the moment, there, there will, you know, you, you're living off a wing and a prayer that each time you, you upgrade to, to new windows, new tools and things like that, that it will continue to build and continue to operate. But if you're not working on the latest tools, that there may come a time when your normal process does stop working. That happened in some regards on the Apple community with um, Apple, the release to a couple of years ago with Apple Silicon. While the transition isn't bad with Rosetta 2, there will come a time when Apple goes, see you later, and we're not going to support all this AI stuff on, on Intel anymore. It, Whereas Windows has in the past been pretty much protected from that, that is, is no longer the case. That I'm getting to the stage where I used to produce 32-bit versions of Windows apps now and have to go back and test Windows 7, Windows 8 and that sort of stuff. Now pretty much I go, I only go, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to be supporting Win, um, 64-bit versions on Windows 10 and above. Everything else, I hope that it works, but I'm not guaranteeing it. So Windows is now unfortunately playing the game, uh, playing Apple's game of stopping legacy applications. Yes, Paul? Yep. So 
So, so the, the comment is about the use of Tim Parnell's Lifeboat software, which he is an active member of the forum, and there are, if you just search for Lifeboat on the forum, you'll find lots of links to his software, which you can download and use. Uh, he asks you to make him a payment, sort of essentially beer money, because it, just, just to keep his, uh, his cost going. What it means is if, if you don't use his software, usually when you deploy onto a Linux server, at least I have a document about 10 pages long which lists all the steps I do. When I get a new Ubuntu machine, I need to in, you know, make sure it's up to date, install these particular capabilities and things in it, uh, boom, boom, boom. And if you muck up any one of them, you, the whole thing can be toast. Tim has made that a lot simpler by using his software. You install his software on there, it, uh, and you, you, you run a, a Mac or, a, I think, a Windows version of the application as well. You just drag and drop your, your built application into his code. It will automatically install it for you and do all the checks. Uh, I don't know if it does Docker, but it certainly does um, uh, handle uh, multiple simultaneous versions of your web app running, uh, and you can you know, change the number of instances that it runs. And it just, he's kept been very good at keeping that up to date. And I don't use it myself, I just see on the forum people raving about it. I think you're right, if, if I were to go back from Windows to Linux, I would definitely use the Lifeboat software and, uh, and just take all the pain out of it, uh, of the whole. It, of installing and running uh, on, uh, on, on a Linux box. If you, but it, that's if you want to run it on your own server or, or on a client server, if you want to take even more pain away, but you're happy, you're happy for the client or you to pay the cost, then of course use Zojo Cloud, which takes even more of that pain away. Okay, so the, the comment is about a, another product I don't know of called Ansible that uh, is a, is a, it sounds like it's a general tool, not necessarily just a, a Zojo web tool, which will uh, manage the, the environment for you where it will keep all of your, your code, your write playbooks to presumably install your web service and have it managed and run effectively for you. Yeah, Great. It's also highly potent, so if you run it again, it will not, it will not create new instances. It will put it into that state. So the comment is that using this Ansible product, you can, uh, m you can ask the software to set the state as to how you want the machine and the application to run, and it will do all the changes behind the scenes for you. So the more, the mo uh, the more that we can manage the complexity, the better. And Linux is one of those environments which is, it's moving along as well. Not only is Mac and Windows moving along, but Linux is moving along. And sometimes you may find with new versions of Linux, what you did last year no longer works this year. And so if you can have somebody who is keeping up, has developed a tool and is keeping up to date with it, that they can help you move along with the later versions too. Okay, any other questions or comments? I think I'm over time.